I know things you never see. You never see someone taking a shit while running at full speed. Come on, Key, get rid of some of them turds in the shit box. Welcome to the Bathroom Break Podcast with me, Rab himself. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bathroom Break Podcast. I'm your host, Rab himself, and I'm sitting here with the lovely Joe Franz. Hello, Chris Rab. <laughs> Hello! Uh, for anybody that doesn't know this uh, sexy beast across from me, it's, uh, he is the basically the camera dude, the director, the cinematographer, the writer, just every, wears every hat in the world for all the CKY videos, for Haggard, for Ming Hags, for a lot of the uh, him music videos. CKY music videos. I mean, the list goes on and on. He's also an author. He uh, is the author of Dream Seller, the Brandon Novak uh, memoir, and uh, the Brandon Novak Chronicles, and has a new project coming out too. But um, yeah, let me just uh, suck your dick a little more. And I know, then... <laughs> Jesus Christ. I don't need to say anything after that. I'll be happy if we just leave it at that. Like, and that's I'm, a wrap. I'm... That's it. Uh, we're out of here. <laughs> but, uh, but no, seriously, it's like it's impressive what you've done over the course of your life and and I kind of wanted to get into a little bit of how you got into filmmaking and uh, and then obviously later into becoming an author and doing those things but but uh, at first I'd really love to just hear like what got you into making movies or commercials or you know all those things it wasn't easy nor was it glamorous um, so I got first got my hands on a video camera when I was in my teens filming my friends uh, skateboarding and stuff. And, uh, I remember when I was about 13, we had a, a project in school where you had to write down a whole bunch of stuff about yourself. And someone asked, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I didn't know what to put down. I never really thought about it. I mean, other than firemen and policemen and the things you think romanticize about when you're young. And then my friend put filmmaker and I was like, wait, you can do that? <laughs> Your people are allowed to just be a filmmaker? And he goes, I guess, that's what I wanna do. So I put that on there and it was something that sparked my imagination. And that guy was Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> recently we've uh, compared career paths. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I think <laughs> I'm edging him out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I mean, gro like growing up in Philly, it, it, it's true, I feel the same way. Like I, you know, I'm in that path now, I live in LA, but growing up around here, there's never like an idea that you can actually do that. Well, okay, so we're, you're younger than me, you know. I am. So, yeah, a little bit. even <laughs> yeah. though I look as good as you, <laughs> even though I'm 12 years, 15 years older than you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, well, okay, so Philadelphia was a lot different back then. Okay, so we had um, it, it was a, a post-industrial revolution world in Philadelphia. So all of the factories were closing. J there was joblessness. There was homelessness was now a problem. Um, all houses were getting foreclosed on. There was no work. So if Philadelphia was the place where if you had something going on, you'd move to New York or LA. Back then it was cheap to do so. Um, it and was then here comes this artsy little guy like, well, I want to make films. Yeah. It's like, kid, get a hammer. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> was, well, you, know? well, you figure if you wanted a job, here's how you had to get a job. You had, now this is me with a college education. Um, in order to get a job in film, there's no internet. Right. So everyone's like, why don't you just apply online? Well, that's not gonna happen. There's no online. There's, what's so online? you would wait two days for a New York newspaper to come to Philadelphia. Oh, you go to the library, you, get the, you go through the want ads, then you would write a letter and include your application. <laughs> What's a letter? So yeah. They, yeah. I mean, at that point, that's it, crazy. It was hardly facts, but a lot Dude, of places that, weren't mean, equipped with facts. Yeah, and, and of course, they would never get back to you, and the job will be fulfilled within a day by someone in New York. Yeah. So me, out of college, I couldn't get a job shooting weddings. It was, it was fucking depressing. Oh, you couldn't even shoot weddings, you're saying? I wasn't good enough. Oh, man. And I, I would tr I, believe me, I tried. I called everybody in the phone book. Yeah. So I got a job. I said, well, what's the one job that people need? It's someone who can shoot film. And it's like, I'm not gonna start as a director and everything, but I didn't wanna start as, as a production assistant because I tried that. I actually PA'd on a on Kevin Smith movie, uh, Chasing Amy. I actually ruined 
the entire film. <laughs> I don't you... know if you want to get into that. Well, yeah. Well, we of course we need to get into that. Okay. Um, okay. Well, so here I am, fresh out of film school. <laughs> I'm working as a security guard because I can't get a job shooting weddings. And I went into a Starbucks to look at the, the filmmaking trades, the magazines like independent filmmaking. Um, you, you know, you got to get a bunch of indie film mags. And so I'm looking through them and someone's like, hey, did you hear Kevin Smith, the girl behind the counter, I was friends with her. Kevin Smith's making his new movie. I was like, where? She goes, oh, it's over in Red Bank, New Jersey. They're shooting today. <laughs> I wrote down, I fucking wrote down Red Bank, New Jersey mm -hmm. on a fucking scrap of paper, got into my car and drove. Now, I didn't know where the fuck it was. I don't remember how I got there. It took like three and a half hours to get there. Yeah. So I'm there and, it, and they're shooting. And I just show up, and I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm a new PA. They're like, we, I, I'm sorry. Everyone's like, we don't really recognize you. And I'm like, no, I'm just here to volunteer. I'll do whatever you want. You want me to lose something? I'll get coffee. <laughs> and they're like, okay, uh, sure. Hey, an independent filmmaker, great, cool. So I'm going around, and uh, I I'm get- just in, here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just here. Yeah. Like, uh, all right, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. No, no, they, they were really I know, cool. but it's awesome that they did that. They were putting me to work. Yeah. People were teaching me what a C-stand was. Yeah. People were showing me the lights. It was really fun. I felt really cool. Because I grew up on Clerks. Yeah. Like, that's what I wanted. That's, yeah. that's an echelon of filmmaking that no longer exists. You don't right. have indie films like that anymore. So that's what I wanted to do. And, like, I felt like I was a part of it. And so they took me to... Here's a good story. So they took me to the craft services station. So I'm talking to the dude who runs the craft services. And he's like, you know, this is my goldfish. You know, I got the goldfish here. People like the goldfish. I got my Teddy Grahams. You know, I have, you know, some vegetables. You know, I like to, you know, you don't want to feed them too much. Teddy everyone, Grahams. You want everyone to wait for the meal. <laughs> and like, don't touch this. So he opens up a cooler like it was uh, 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 the Ark from Indiana Jones. And yeah, the, yeah. And the, and the Temple of Doom. Or the, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's like. I'm like, I see chocolate milk on ice. He goes, don't touch this. This is Kevin's <laughs> personal chocolate milk. He needs it. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I'm so excited. And then here comes fucking Ben Affleck. <laughs> so he fucking comes over. And so the dude do doing the craft services is he's talking to... Okay, every movie, there's always two hot girls walking around with clipboards, and no one knows what they do. Uh, no one knows what I know what, what they do. They're just is. hot. <laughs> yeah. It just helps out. So he's talking to the two hot girls with clipboards, yeah. and here comes great man Ben Affleck in this cool jacket that he had on from a wardrobe. <laughs> and so, of course, they're not going to talk to the craft services dude. They want to talk to the hot Ben Affleck. Yeah, so yeah. he's standing there, and as he's talking, he picks up. There's this huge bottle of Tums on the table, and he picks up the huge bottle of Tums, and so now the girls are here, Ben Affleck's here, the craft services dude is here. As he's talking, he opens up the bottle of Tums and he's gingerly throwing them, excluding the craft services dude from the conversation, throwing the Tums at his face. One by one. So, at the so craft girls. service guy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like, so girls, blah, 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 blah. Throwing the, the things at the dude's face. Yeah. And the dude's like, huh, that's pretty funny, huh? Oh, he has to act like he doesn't want to kill him. He's getting bullied. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah. This is yeah. worse than grade school. <laughs> He's so proud that he has, you know, he has the Teddy Grahams, he has the chocolate milk, he has the Cheez-Its. <laughs> and here he is getting humiliated yeah. like he did in high school by the, by the school bully. Yeah. So now Ben Affleck, uh, so, so the kid's like, oh, that's pretty funny. He goes, Ben Affleck looks at him and goes, you think that's funny, huh? He goes, yeah, well, how would you feel if I threw him at you? He goes, oh. You want to throw them at me? Is that what you want to do? Here, take some and like shove some in the dude's chest. And he goes, throw them at me. Go ahead. Go ahead, do it. And so now the girls are sitting there watching and Ben Affleck squares off like John claude Van Damme. Mm -hmm. And the kid's like, huh, huh, throws a little tum at Ben Affleck. He goes, what's that? Karate chops it out of the air. And he goes, and the guy goes, oh, that was a pretty good karate move. He goes, go on, do it again. And by the third tum, he missed it with the great man karate chop, and the tum goes, boonk, and rolls <laughs> off onto the ground. So Ben Affleck goes, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. this, I told you you could throw them at me. Yeah. You're not throwing them at me. This jacket isn't mine. This belongs to wardrobe. This isn't mine. You're messing it up. Look. See, and so, yeah. and, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like, yeah, you know, yeah. I didn't mean yeah, to yeah. like mess with the wardrobe or whatever. I didn't know what I was doing. He goes, he goes, well, listen to me when I talk to you, man. Jesus Christ. 
and he <laughs> takes the Tums out of the dude's hand, dumps them over his head, and goes, now get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Oh man! Now that I, sounds that sounds what I would expect from that guy. I was so fucking pissed off, dude. Yeah. I was like, "You fucking son of a bitch!" It's, it, isn't it enough that you're the star of the movie? No. Isn't it enough <laughs> that the hot girls are talking to you? Yeah. Anyway, I wasn't prepared to tell that fucking story. Yeah, but that's hilarious. So, so anyway, so it was the end of the first night, and <laughs> the the sun is going down. They want to do this steady cam shot. And it takes forever to fucking... So it's like the one steady cam shot they have scheduled for the whole movie. And it's yeah. just like, it's raining. So in order to make it rain, they have the uh, um, uh, fire trucks there and the whole fire department. Yeah. And they, they hacked into a fire hydrant and it's supposed to go up in the sprinkler and come down. And the cameraman's supposed to be walking backwards with the fucking steady cam and everything. And it's this whole big thing. It takes hours to set up. And now I have to take a piss. Bad. <laughs> and so I'm looking around, and, I, and there's no place to piss. Everywhere I go, there's townspeople. There's, there's bystanders watching. Traffic <laughs> is slowing to a stop. Yeah. There's police everywhere. There's no place to duck out and piss. Mm -hmm. So I go to, I, I don't know who it was. It was like the production manager or yeah, like yeah. some. Like an AD or something. Yeah, yeah some yeah. like important guy. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, man, I really got to take a piss. I can't find a place to go, man. This town's on lockdown. Can I, uh. Is there like a bathroom? He goes, he goes, yeah, I don't think I know you. I can give you the key, but who are you again? I'm like, my name's Joe. I'm just here to volunteer, blah, blah, blah. So he gives me the key, and he goes, yeah, it's that building over there. And he's looking at me sideways. <laughs> and I, understandably so. He's giving me a fucking ring of keys and saying yeah, it's his yeah, key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I go. I put now. In the meantime, they're about to shoot the fucking steady cam shot. Now the sun is coming up at yeah. this point. So the, sh the shot is fucked because it's a night shot. So I put my key into the door, into the building that I thought he was pointing at. I turned the key. <laughs> this fucking alarm sounds through the town. And I look up, and there's just one of those big bullhorn speakers like that, like from World War II. Yeah. Like, you know, like the death siren when the Nazis are attacking? <laughs> that is going off throughout the town. Yeah. And everyone goes, whoom. <laughs> looking at me and it's like one of those movies where like yeah. the, the the fucking camera shot goes jump 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 so i'm just there like a deer caught in the headlights <laughs> they with this all key. know you are obviously the and dumb the dude dick. runs over and goes what the fuck dude what are you doing i'm like i'm like you you said to go to the bathroom and he goes i didn't say this door i said that door uh. and so he's looking at me and he goes wait a minute i don't have a key. and the door's open so I quick shut the door, and the alarm goes off. He goes, how did you open that door? I said, the key you gave me. And he said, this key doesn't fit that lock. I said, yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> so I put it in. Now the key doesn't work. So apparently it was an older key. And those older keys, a lot of them fit, lock, like if you put it in, the, in a weird angle. Yeah, yeah. So now it's not working. And so he goes, let me try it. And, it. and it doesn't work. And I said, let me try it again because it just worked. <laughs> and I put it in and, and now it opens up again. I'm like, see? And I close it. He goes, let me try it. Now it's not working. And he goes, who are you really? <laughs> who do you work for? So yeah. in his mind, I'm some fucking dude with another key trying to rob the record store. So he doesn't know what I'm up to. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, dude, I swear to God it worked. So we tried over and over again. It worked. And, it, and But now they have to have the police department come shut up the fucking alarm. The sun's coming up. The fucking, the, 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 everyone's standing on the Ben Affleck yeah. and the fucking the, the Joey Lauren Adams or whatever. They're all fucking standing there. Kevin Smith's looking at me like I'm an asshole. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now, so, the, awesome. so they fucking come. They do the, they shut off the alarm, all this shit. I ruined the whole shot. Put them behind schedule for a fucking hour. I mean, it was no easy thing to shut that fucking alarm off. <laughs> so at the end of it, I, I'm, I'm like, oh, thank God everything worked out. I'm like, I still got to take a piss. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, Jesus Christ, here, I'm just going to let you in the building. So he unlocks the door, which is what he should have done ahead of time. He shouldn't have right, gave me the fucking right. keys. Yeah. So I run in. And I can't find the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm looking at like, I didn't know it at the time, but it was the set. You know how in the movie Chasing Amy, they have the art studio? Yeah. And they're like, they're doing the artwork yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff, like their house. So it's that room. So I'm looking around. I can't find a bathroom. I go up the stairs. I'm opening all the doors. So I pissed in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> of their set apartment. <laughs> so when Naturally. You, when you watch yeah. the movie Chasing Amy, there's a door in back of them through some of the shots. <laughs> Just so you know, Joe Franz pissed in that closet. That's awesome. That was my first contribution <laughs> to the filmmaking world. That's hilarious. And I don't dude. know if that answered your original question. Yes, it did. That's how you got into it. You got into it by pissing in the closet and chasing Amy. <laughs> that's, uh, dude, that's hilarious. That's yeah. amazing. And after that, I worked for uh, two more years. Uh, so, okay, so I got a job at a photo mat, um, mm -hmm. which was a job that paid uh, six, I bargained my way up to like 675 an hour. Killing College it. College graduate. Killing it. Killing it, dude. <laughs> and I'm handing people's negatives. But I was learning negatives. Yeah. I was looking at people's negatives all day. Two fucking years I worked that job. I worked my way up to, they had a, um, uh, a telecine process. I, uh, sorry, uh, not to, uh, yeah, it was, it was a cheap telecine doing people's home movies. Yeah. So now I'm looking at positives. I'm looking at people's films and their exposures. So then I got a job over at NFL, NFL Films working in their film lab, made, I saved up all my money, bought a Bolex camera, um, made a little showreel and got jobs instantly. Now, granted, I was 27 at the time, so mm -hmm. I'm around there, and I finally got my first fucking job in film, and it's, it happened like that. My boss... Um, Steve Grass, who uh, was the uh, the founder of uh, Gyro Worldwide, a, a Philly ad agency, he fucking flew me everywhere. Very fucking. I mean, he was a hard dude to work for, but he gave me like he was he was a sink or swim guy. Yeah. I'm gonna give you the break of your lifetime. You can fuck it up if you want to, then you're fucking fired. I'm gonna throw you right into I'm gonna throw you right into the flames and see if you burn. Yeah. I'm throw you <laughs> into the water, see if you sink yeah. or swim. So. Yeah, man. So I went to New Zealand, Japan, Australia, England, fucking all over the world shooting Puma, um, shooting, I mean, number one commercials, man. Like, yeah. like slotted, like, remember The Simpsons was the number one show? Yeah. So it'd be like, The Simpsons. They'd have the song. Then there's that big commercial. I was doing those commercials. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's how I got my fucking. Big so I love break. that you're like, it happened like that after a bunch of years. Oh, of after years. Yeah, 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 years. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like that's usually how it is, but most people think, oh, it's just going to happen like that. It's like, no, you got to kind of work hard at it and go after it and keep going after it. And no one gives you anything in this world. Right. You right. have to earn whatever. Like, dude, so back to. Philadelphia at the time was a place where if you had something going on, you'd move to LA or New York. I didn't like those places. Yeah. I love Philadelphia. And now it's completely different. You can yeah. have any career doing anything you want in Philly because it's, it's so fucking expensive to live in New York or LA. An apple costs $6, for God's sake. <laughs> Your <laughs> yeah, rent yeah, is $4,000, yeah. what used to cost 200 in the 90s. Yeah, it's yeah. fucking crazy. Yeah, for yeah. real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, um, yeah, so I always wanted to stay in Philly, and I always figured out a way to do it. Um, it was something else to tell, but yeah, I, I then, forget what we were talking no, so about. You, so you, and you did the Puma commercials, like Adidas and, like, all these kind of – Yeah, yeah that like, kind of a thing. I remember that. And then, and then so then what kind of, um, you know – after that, obviously, you, you did that for a while, and then you then then we all kind of oh, came together. Oh, so then yeah, so then my boss, so I was working on one of my boss's films. He did these bikini girl films called the Bikini Bandits. Yeah, and it was pretty cool. Like he had um, uh, what's his name from the Ramones who died, Dee Dee Ramone or whatever. Yeah, and he had Corey Feldman come. It was fucking yeah. great, you know. And I, I, I like beating all these people. So this kid shows up, this Bam Margera kid, and Ryan Dunn. And I was a very keen cinematographer at the time. People were just figuring out who I was, and I was very good at it, like yeah. because I studied it so hard. You yeah, know, yeah, it wasn't yeah. a gift. And so um, they showed up, and Bam was like, "Hey, man, like I did like this video, the CKY, Land Speed," and I was like, "I saw that because at the time I had helped found an art gallery in Philadelphia, and we showed it." Yeah. And I was like, "I love that film. That was so cool. Such a cool thing you're doing." He's like, "Well, I just got sponsored skating." He goes. My brother wants to make this music video, and uh, you know, I, I can pay for the film, but I can't pay you to do it. But I promise, it's gonna get on MTV. Yeah, you're Back right. Back then, everybody had a everyone's music video. We're gonna make a video. It's gonna get on TV. It, all the story in the book, but. Yeah. He promised to pay for the film. And back then, film was incredibly expensive. Yeah. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something, Rab. How big, <laughs> how big is a memory card? Uh, About as big as a stick of gum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or a thumbnail? <laughs> and how many hours of footage can you put on that? 
I mean, it all. I guess it all depends on what type of footage you're shooting. Um, yeah, how yeah. many hours? Five, maybe, on no, yeah. with the bigger cards. Yeah, I don't. This that is a substance known as film. <laughs> you know how many hours are on this? Three, or sorry, two minutes and forty-five seconds at twenty-four <laughs> frames a second. To show you what this substance looks like. So it comes in a box like this. The reason it was in a box like this was so you could shoot and then mail it if you're shooting old wartime footage or something like that. Yeah. So it comes in this, and then comes in this little container. You unwrap it, and now you're exposing it to daylight, but this is what's called daylight spool. This protects it from the daylight. You take off the sticker, and this runs through the camera at 24 frames a second is motion picture speed. Now, the camera that you use, Brad, remember this? Oh, yeah. Remember this, yeah. Brad? Oh, I feel like that was attached to your arm <laughs> for, for so many years. Rake has nightmares Dude. when he sees this. <laughs> because when, awesome. when I brought out this camera when we did CKY, yeah. it was on. Because... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this... Two minute, 45 second spool of film costs, back at the time, $100 <laughs> for every two minutes and, and 45 seconds Dude, that went awesome. through the camera. Yeah. And in today's money, that's $200. Yeah. That's but, fucking crazy. And then I, and I always just remember, yeah, when that happened, it was like, you better fucking go for it or you better make it right or you better, you better just get it right right away. We were laying the so hammer There down. was a lot of pressure to, to just either just go for it immediately or like whatever if, if you were doing something crazy, but or if like it was like Raytheon's picnic or whatever that, when, when he was <laughs> picnicking or whatever and yeah. Ryan shit on him. Or if you're yeah, doing yeah, a stunt, yeah, 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 you yeah. got to hurt yourself in the first shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You gotta Don't take the fucking break easy. Break something immediately. We're wasting money on your pain. <laughs> 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 but dude, that's so but, fucking but, cool. But to check have it that out. out. Yeah. So the Swiss made. So this doesn't run on batteries. So the Swiss made this, and the Swiss are masters at clock making. So here's how you do it: you wind up the fucking camera, which is great at being an indie guy because I had to have less accessories, right? Yeah. So I'm winding, I'm winding, I'm winding. All right, Rab, you ready for your take? <laughs> We're at yeah. the end of the wind. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. We go through, we're going to put it to 24 frames a second. Oh. There we go. You hear, there's a noise. Whenever they would hear that yeah. noise, they would know <laughs> shit was going on. Now, this will go on for about 25 seconds, and that's all you have yeah. in the take. Yeah, is there something in there or no? There's no, there's there. no yeah, film yeah, in yeah. here. <laughs> but so you get, you got, you know, the takes were, and if we were shooting in slow motion, you got a 15 second take. Yeah. So it was fucking. So this old technology was the thing that boosted. Dude, that's so cool. So when Bam Bam knew I shot with this thing. Yeah. So he wanted me to shoot CKY ninety six quite bitter beings video. I think it was called. Yeah. Yep, that was it. I think it was, there was another one. Yeah, we'll go I think with that. that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, he wanted me to shoot a CKY video, and he's like, "Well, I promise it'll get on TV." But I didn't care. I was like, "Well, do you have a script and storyboard?" Which is what you ask if you're in advertising. He goes, well, I don't know what that stuff is. I mean, I know what that stuff is. I don't have it. I was like, well, what are we going to film? And he goes, well, my friend's going to cruise by and, like, give me the finger or something. Ryan Dunn here. And then, uh, and then my brother's going to steal a bike. And then I'm going to kick him off the bike. I'm like, hold on now. Yeah, yeah. When you kick him off the bike and he eats shit and slams on a cement, how are we going to do that stunt? How are we going to break that up into shots? See, that's the thing. He goes, yeah. I'm just, he's going to just ride across the street. I'm going to kick him off the bike. He's <laughs> yeah, going to yeah, eat yeah. shit. I was like, wait, you're going to kick your brother off a bike and he's going to slam on a cement. Bam's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, what else? He goes, well, then Ryan's going to take the car and he's going to be trying to get away and he's going to crash into a bridge. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute. What about the permits? What about yeah, yeah, insurance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about all the things <laughs> we need to None pull of that off shit. this? And he yeah. goes, well, what do you, how do you think I'm going to do it? We're just going to buy a car for 100 bucks and crash it into a bridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you're going to buy a car for 100 bucks and crash it into a bridge? I'm going to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went. Ryan Dunn got arrested for fucking crashing into the bridge, and uh, we made a great music video. And sure enough, 
it fucking got on MTV. It was a, it was a, it was on full rotation on Total Request Live. Yeah. And so that went into the CKY videos. After we did that, we, we after CKY three, we went into Haggard the movie, and um, I want to tell you something, Rab. It was such a special time to me because you have to understand what we were talking about before. Yeah. With you guys, I think it was a little different the way you guys looked at it. So, you know, this was your first time. You gave something your all, and you achieved it. Yeah. Like, you did it. Right. I had been trying this for years, and I had spent years of my life going from different groups of people, trying to find people that I could, that I could, we met eye to eye creatively. Yeah, yeah. And also were willing to work hard. Yeah. No one gives you shit in this world. You have to fucking go earn it. And you guys were like actually willing to do the work. Yeah. Whereas my Philly people, it's like people would be like, yeah, I got this idea for a movie. I'm like, cool. I'll do all the pre-production. Let's do it. It'll be fun. It'll be great. And I would do all this shit. Everyone would be like, yeah, dude, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. seems like it's going to be a lot of work, dude. I'm like, you said you wanted to do this. I, I did my part. Fucking do it. Dude, so- and that's, I mean, and that's something, honestly, um, these days for me that like, you know, you, not to say you get bummed out about it, but, but, but you miss that because there was such a collaboration collective thing that was willing like everyone was willing to show up to do it to go after it to make it happen and that's a rare thing it really is like and you and i didn't know that as a young guy because all i knew was my friends and i we just go for shit we just make it happen we're, we're determined to go film something right now we're going to get footage regardless of what happens it's going to happen and you know with all of all of us like you know it, that was that was the thing and and then now years later you go oh it's just not that easy like you try and this is i go through that now where i i'm like have friends and you talk about this and you plan this out and you do all the work to get it ready and then somebody has like a dentist appointment or some stupid thing and you're like what well, we had this planned yeah and it's hard it was it, it that was a hard thing for me after the fact was realizing damn not everybody is that discipline and that determined to do stuff mm-hmm. and that that's hard it's a hard pill to swallow because you're used to that at a young age for so long and then all of a sudden man uh that yeah, yeah. They're, they're making excuses and then it was filming. such a special yeah. thing yeah especially when we made the movie haggard yeah it was like before see no one really had anything yet i was living in an apartment my rent i was in a crack neighborhood yeah. My my rent was one hundred and thirty three dollars. That shows you how fucking bad that place was. <laughs> yeah, like we would have a, a neighbor who would try and break in the house. I had to fend him off with a fucking hammer. Like yeah. it was no joke, dude. Yeah, like I I've, I know. You, know? No. And you guys, you were living in Bam's basement. Uh, uh, B- would living sleep in, on the pipe. Yeah, living in the back little like not finished part, and. Didn't have a car, so I was driving the car from Haggard. The Rab himself ship mobile. Because I, I had gotten a DUI when I was young, like a year before, and then I, I had totaled my car, almost killed myself, all that kind of stuff. But then uh, I didn't have a car, so then I took that car, and I was trying to drive that car up to college, and it didn't have brakes. And, and we all and like we know that story of, of that where you know the dashboard catches on fire, the brakes run out, I fly through the toll booth. That Yelling, whole thing. no brakes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And but that yeah you're right we had nothing that was what I had I had a fucking like Freddy Cougar like boiler room little existence yeah. in Bam's house at Bam's parents you, house you slept on and a then, shit pipe yeah yeah <laughs> and then and then some borrowed car that had no brakes yeah 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 <laughs> and you lived with crackheads so it's like people yeah. would sit around and I'd be like let's do a time lapse everyone's like what's a time lapse I'm like it's you doing something in the foreground and it'll take an hour to do screen time it'll last seven seconds. Yeah, but it's like you. I remember you. Remember you held the cigarette in your mouth yeah, and yeah, it just yeah. burned all the way. You know, it's yeah. Like, like Ryan Dunn would do that. You would do that. You know. Yeah. And that by the time we made the sequel to that Ming Hags, which yeah. you weren't a part of, which right. is the smartest fucking career move you ever made. <laughs> making a movie. We'll get yeah, to that. Yeah, we'll yeah, we'll yeah, get to yeah. that later. Yeah, but yeah. uh, so but um, yeah, it was a very very special and unique time, which can never be replicated. Um, we could never, ever, like, if Hollywood got the script to Haggard and wanted to remake it, it right. would be like when What's His Name remade Psycho. It'd yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. ew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Like, yeah, because it was you're exactly it. We were capturing a moment in time. It and, was, it yeah. was literally a moment of time. Yeah. It was like, like one of the reasons everyone's like, what's with all the time lapses of all the construction? Um, why, why, why do you, what, what's with all the, uh, you know, why are we watching bulldozers in fast motion? It's like, 
Westchester was a town in transition. Right. It was a farmland town being turned into a thriving suburb. Right. Your characters in the movie, you and Ryan and 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 uh, Bam's character and even Jen, these were people who were going through great personal alterations of character. And um, Ryan was resistant to it. Ryan's character, he 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 wanted things to stay the same. Yeah, you know, but but time was go- time was moving on, and so Westchester became a character, which symbolized you know this visual world of Westchester symbolized what was going on w- within your characters. Yeah, you know, and it's like there's those little touches and that time we had to make that film. Oh, it was just, it's just uh, we could never do that again if we tried, you know? Yeah. I mean. Dude, and it was so fun. I mean, it, it was just, yeah, it was an incredible experience mm-hmm. doing that. Um, and, and it's funny because it has become something that people, you know, will quote to me or whatever. And, yeah. and you're like, man, that's crazy that it, 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 it is like, like you said, you got into it for the Kevin Smith clerks. And it's kind of like along that realm of like so indie and so, you know, just a bunch of guys trying to, I mean, clearly you knew more than any of us about how to make a movie, but, but most of us are just going, oh, this is fun. But you know? me and Bam needed to balance each other out. And I needed to balance myself out with you guys because I am a planner. I will fucking plan for everything. Now, now you make a plan for it to be fucked up and broken, right? Yeah, That's why yeah. you make a schedule and shit. But I was like, Mr. Buy the book. Here's the way we got to do it and everything. So... As the producer and cinematographer of that film, I was happier picking shit, even though I, I wouldn't sleep for days filming because I could have ultimate. So it's like how it normally works on a film. If you're the cinematographer and you want to change a shot, you got to consult the assistant director. Then the assistant director consults the director and producer, and it's a whole conversation. As the producer right. and cinematographer, well, fuck, I I got to um, I got to. Just change the camera angle. Just do whatever I want. Yeah. You know. You had freedom, like just creative freedom, really. Um. Fuck. Hold on. This is our second podcast uh, that we're supposed to do. Uh. Shit. Hold on. Sorry. This is our next podcast. He's well, gonna be on Hollywood the calls. Show. Hello. <laughs> Are you here? Yeah, we're pulling up right now. Okay. Hold on. Uh. Just give us a couple minutes. Oh, we're almost done. Okay, bye-bye. So, sorry. He's going to be on the Novak and Franz podcast uh, after this. So anyway, <laughs> let, me, let, me get to the, let me get to this shit. Yeah. So speaking of that, I have a present for you, Rab. Nice. You've already seen this, but you probably forget signing it. Okay. So this is a special thing, what I think, because this— Oh, man, yeah. This, to me, help exemplifies what we went through to make that film. So this was— Damn. This says extras needed. So back before the day, ever, so we needed extras for the invention of the future contest. <laughs> and so it was. Dude, is this so, really a present for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is awesome. Oh, I got yeah, way yeah. more, yeah. way more upstairs. Nice. But uh. Oh, so it's not unique. <laughs> no, way more presents for you. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so, uh, so I'm not special. Great, so be- everyone's like, why didn't you just Twitter it out? Why didn't you Facebook it out? MySpace. There was no internet. Yeah. So to get. People to show up as extras to your set. We would we would went we went around and hung these in town. And it, what's funny, what it says is, extras needed, a Universal Pictures production. Ah, <laughs> <it's some laughs> bullshit. We were doing whatever we could yeah, to make yeah, it sound yeah. important for people to show up. By the makers of CKY and Jackass. Now we were in Jackass, yeah, but I don't yeah, think yeah, we yeah. were really the we makers. <laughs> you know, so this is, uh, and it has the date that we filmed. Yeah. I just, yo, uh, I haven't gotten Jess. I always see Jess, and I always forget to bring these, so Jess's signature goes right there. Yeah, yeah. And you, whoever, Lord Bataro or fucking whoever yeah. else decides. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Dude, brother. thank you. Um, um, tell these guys to fuck off. We got a podcast to do. I know. They're leaving me messages now. Yeah. They, we got some time. Yeah. Anyway, so. Yeah, we got time. Let, um, them, let them sweat. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So then, yeah. So then we go through, you know, all, obviously all of that. Dude, this is so cool. Um, we go through that, that, you know, that kind of world of CKY. Um, and then that, that leads into Jackass. And then what happens, like, you know, oh, after we do Haggard, um, then, you know, we did the Jackass movie, but then after that, we do Viva La Bam. Mm-hmm. And, like, I guess for me, like, knowing you and having filmed with you for years at that point, it was just funny when, like, like 
MTV and like other people come in. Why? And what happens when MTV <laughs> comes in? <right? laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, no, no, no. What happens? They they pull the fun out of it. <laughs> but but it, I, it, it I becomes, have proof. Yeah, and it becomes this thing where it's so corporate, and it's like, well, well, everyone needs a break for lunch at this time, and it's like, well, you know what? Like, I'm ready to jump off the roof, or Dunn's gonna fucking ride this bike off of something, and and like all the the other camera people are like at lunch and then who's left to film it all Franz who gets the best shots Franz and then ended up and uh, Roger Bagley at that point too and Roger is a skateboard you know videographer and you're you know all of those things and so it ends up being you you two that are always with us shooting all of the the stuff that we end up like getting on air and it ends up being the main stuff because we were more comfortable with you. Like we were just more comfortable with like, yeah. no, Franz knows the rhythm. Like, like you said, you're a planner, but at a time where you had to learn like, hey, that isn't really how yes. it goes. This is spot, yeah, this, yeah. yeah, this is ultimate spontaneity. Like, let's yeah. do it. I'm not, and then I'd be like, you guys would like feed me an idea. And then I'd be like, like, okay, um, uh, well shit, okay. And we have like three minutes to film it before the cops come. Yeah. Uh, like you naked in the jock strap. Uh, shit, like, okay, here's how we break down the shots. I'm gonna get a close up of you. You stay here. I'm gonna pop on the long lens as I'm running down the street. Then we got two shots of fucking marry into one. Yeah. Which is, uh, which is funny too, because the day you got arrested for wearing the fucking, uh, <laughs> that, for that wearing thing. the, yeah. so I'm filming you with this when you're, here's an example of what we were just talking about. So you were in the jock strap and you had to have, a bloody asshole wearing nothing but a jock strap <laughs> on the highway. Yeah. Well, we didn't know there was a flasher in town. Yeah. And so people are calling on their cell phones, reporting you to the cops. Yeah. You got arrested in the jock strap, got taken to fucking jail with a bloody ass. Now the cops take me and they uh, park me inside the mall parking lot where I was stationed. Yeah. And the cops like, it's like, oh, where's your, where's your video camera? I was like, I don't have a video camera. I have a film camera. He goes, don't you get technical with me. I want that footage. <laughs> so don't I'm you like, get technical with me. <laughs> so I'm like, fuck, I can't give up the footage. So in the Bolex, there's the feed side, and then there's the take-up side. So the, the unshot footage goes up here, and it runs through the fucking camera, and then the, sh the shot footage is down here. So I broke the fucking thing in half. Oh shit. And then I gave him the unshot footage. I was like, you know what to do with this? I was like, you gotta get this developed. It's gonna cost money. He goes, I know what to do. So I gave him the thing now. I know what to do. When, when you shoot half one of these rolls, yeah. when you let go, the film goes and yeah, it's just yeah. like an octopus just falls out on the ground. And so I gave it to the cop and I'm like, you got this? He goes, <laughs> yes, I got it. I'm like, this is very expensive. And he goes, I got, I got it. So I let go, it goes, Oh, he goes, I go, oh my God, that cost a thousand dollars. He goes, I can't be responsible for this. You get out of here. So you we, get out of here, Zane. We got away with the fucking footage that day. But, Dude, that's awesome. But you, and you know what's funny because of, yes. because of that situation with, oh, there's a flasher. Well, what it ends up dawning on me is, dude, I just did the naked bike ride for Jackass, like not too long before this one. Mm-hmm. And they're going to me. There's somebody going naked through Westchester. This and like that isn't you, is it? I was like, no. And like I believe like that wasn't me. And then as I'm sitting there in jail with a bloody asshole and a jock strap on, I'm going, I think that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so good thing I, because I, I, I mean, I would have passed the lie detector test in the beginning because I really thought no way in hell it's me. And then I thought it through and I was like. I actually just did that. <laughs> you know, like, you know, so, but it was funny, but I just remember what I really remember is uh, being in the, the, the holding cell with the jock strap on, the bloody ass. They had given me a blanket because they go, put your clothes on. I'm like, I don't have any clothes. <laughs> and they're, they're like, you brought me to jail like yeah, this. Yeah. So I put the blanket on. I'm sitting there in the jail cell. And I remember you calling into the police station and I, and they were like, yeah, here you go. And they put me on the phone, but the police officer's standing right there. And you go, Rab, dude, whatever you do, you got to figure out a way to be able to walk out of the police station with just the jock strap and your, <laughs> and your bloody ass hanging out. And I'm looking at the cop, like right at the cop, like, uh, I was like, uh, okay. Like, you know, 
and then I hang up, and he goes, "You do that, and you're coming right back in no here." Way. Yeah, and I was like, "Ah, shit!" Because I didn't, because he heard you through the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I knew I was gonna get locked up, so I couldn't do it. But you were like waiting out there trying to get that footage of I it. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, no, it's so it's so funny. So I mean, so many of those those amazing stories through those days, like you know, just just funny funny days like but, that. But I wanted to share something. So we yeah. talked about how corporate Viva La Bam was. Right, right. I, see, I come with receipts, Rab. Yeah. It, I come with receipts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a script. Oh, yeah. <laughs> from 2004 from Viva La Bam. So this is Pirates. what yeah. they would give us. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was a starting point. So it's like the Viva La Bam writers would, would write scenes. So let's... Let's see what uh, MTV had envisioned. <laughs> Shall we? Do you want to get yeah. into this? Yes. Okay, well, I'll yeah. just read the first page. <clears throat> a sword fight inspires Bam along... Uh, sorry, I don't have my reading glasses on. A sword fight inspires Bam along with trying to get back in April's good graces. Nice uh, sentence structure. For destroying the house. To search for adventure on a sailing ship. They trek out to, what, to Chestertown, Maryland to find a boat. The story evolves into an all-out pirate battle. Cold open. Interior, Castle Bam. April is in the kitchen making sandwiches for Dunn and Bam. <laughs> she says, it's always so noisy with all the hammering outside. They've been building that deck for a week now. When will they be finished? <laughs> when it's done, says this Bam. This whole, like, movie script. <laughs> yeah, it's so yeah. ridiculous. And we never I, even read these. I know, and I remember, like, when you would get them, you would be like, get the hell out of here. You know, like, yeah. you would take them, and, like, as one of the cast guys, you'd just be like, fuck out. I'm like, we're, we're not going to like I would shoot say this that? anyway. Yeah. You just <laughs> throw that out, yeah. She tells him that they're going to have to take care of themselves for a few days because she's going to his, her sister's house. As April talks, she's unable to open a mayonnaise jar. I just love the idea of someone sitting there on a typewriter like... <laughs> this is great. This is great stuff. How can we put a scene out of a mayonnaise jar? <laughs> mayonnaise jars are funny. <laughs> I love a good mayonnaise jar. They're like, what? Well, oh, she man. hands a mayonnaise jar to Bam, but he can't open it either. <gasps> She tells Bam, oh, wait, wait. Bam <laughs> tells Dunn happened? to get Rake to open it. <laughs> okay. Dunn, tell Rake to open it. Why not just not yeah. you? Okay. What, with his teeth? <laughs> but why would Bam tell Dunn to get Rake to yeah, open it? Yeah, I know. Just, <laughs> Rake's bad breath will just open the jar right up. <laughs> so, perfect, says Bam, and he starts grabbing condiments from the kitchen table. Some tomato sauce, a bag of rice, flowers, <laughs> and a bottle of olive oil. So, wait a minute. <laughs> what? Why is all of that included? Why is it on the kitchen table? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, rice, uh, olive oil, all this thing. What is happening? <laughs> and oh, mayonnaise. Yeah. What requires mayonnaise that has those <laughs> ingredients? So um, uh, he, uh, he hands a jar of mayonnaise to April and says, when Ray comes down, ask him to open the mayonnaise. <laughs> April is confused, but agrees. Um, <laughs> Don and Bam sneak into Rake's room where he's peacefully sleeping. Some sunlight streams through the window. No night vision uh, footage. Uh, Dunn sees... Dunn sees a lot of small model rockets and some nerdy NASA souvenirs on a shelf. He holds them up to the camera and whispers, Rake loves these. Oh, my God. And Give puts them on the Give floor by the Give door. Give me this. I'm going to show you that this is the script. <laughs> and I'm going to throw the hell out because that's what we normally would have done. Well, you forgot about the Tim, the Tim Glom part. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't wreck your, your, uh, your, no, your mem right. memorabilia. memorabilia. But, uh, dude, oh, that's hilarious. And that's such a good, like, see, because you were on the production side of that, being like, you, you actually probably had to play, like, Oh, hey, how, how's everybody doing? Can I get you a coffee? How's that? Oh, okay. No! I mean, I that, almost got fired every, well, every no, season. I, know. I got fired. I know. They yeah. didn't want me. At one point, I did see you like out like underneath like a pine tree, just like shooting a time lapse while things. I'm like, Franz, what are you doing out here? You're like, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm over it. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I was like, but that's what would end up happening. And and, uh, and Bam and I have talked about that at times too. Like where, like I would just be in my car, like smoking weed, you know, and like and like writing, trying to write other scripts and do other things. I was just uh, checked out because I think at points when it becomes that it's it's hard because you go from a time where we were all just a bunch of friends going out and enjoying this and having a blast and filming things to like not to say that we weren't grateful for Viva La Bam. I mean it was an awesome experience. Yeah. We got to experience a lot of things that it really was. Travel. And, and, yeah, and I'm and not trying to sound ungrateful because it was it was awesome. It was great. 
but absolutely, it was just such a different flow of things from where we came from yeah. in this, like, yo, you are kind of the masters of your domain, and then mm -hmm. it, and then you become like, hey, Rab, wait here until we need you to stand in the background and laugh, and then remember that laugh you do? They love that laugh. And I would, <laughs> and I would be like, well, why don't you just make me laugh? Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, oh can you just do it? Like... Dude, uh, Brandon's I, funny. Why doesn't he just say something and I guarantee I'll laugh? Yeah. You know, so but it did get to those points and and uh and that you know, and that becomes I think part of all of it, really. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you look at the the course of anybody's um, you know, career in that in that field, it's like I mean, you, you know, you could argue a lot of filmmakers first movie is their best and then they kind of taper off. And it's like, well, because things because elements of the whole entire process change and that and that affects things. That's a very good point. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, there's uh, what the Germans would call the zeitgeist theory. Yeah. So that that means, you know, at the, the, the correct time and the correct place in history, as if it was preordained from the beginning of time all the perfect elements will come together and create something beautiful you know and you it, it's weird you can try and force that but right. i find i found that more often than not it, it happens so naturally yes you know so what like when i met you guys it was like i remember you guys had filmed with people before that you that you hated and with with us it was like it was like old friends Get, you know, getting together. It's like we had the same sense of humor. We had the same appreciation for things that were ludicrous. Yeah. Um, you know, things that weren't <laughs> funny, we thought was fucking funny. Yeah. Still to this day, that's the way it is. And, and I think, and even just getting together with you now and getting together with any of the guys, and when that happens, it, it's like there's just a connection there that, yeah. that you, you don't have with other people. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, but yeah, okay. So then, so then after Viva La Bam, um, you go into some other. You, you did Ming Hags, and, you, and and then that, and um, and I kind of uh, went a different direction. Uh -huh. But uh, but I wanted to get I wanted to get a little bit into uh, the Brandon Novak story of you know, because I always remember Novak coming up from Baltimore. Like one minute he looks like some wigger kid with like this weird shape up haircut. The next minute he looks like Bam, yeah. and he's this rock star guy. And then he's trying to tell me I'm sober, and then I'm not sober. And then this, and then he'd show me like these coins of like I'm nine months sober. I'm like Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, I just saw you drinking wine. He's like, well that doesn't count. It's like that does count. And so like, and I was what drunk. About the, what about the I was coke drunk we snorted? As shit yeah. all the time back then. Yeah. And uh, and. So I was like, and I still had some kind of inkling of like, I don't think that counts. Uh, you know, yeah, you're, you're doing this and that. But, um, but I wanted to talk about that because you kind of have followed his journey a little bit, especially being so close to him in, in you know, you wrote Dream Seller. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, and then you, you did the... Well, in all fairness you know, to Novak, he wrote 30 pages of, of one... <laughs> uh, well, one one uh, <laughs> run-on sentence. No, he did. So, yeah. okay. Well, I mean, he, he, you worked with him to get the stories yes. so that you, and you did the actual physical I helped writing. Yes. But yes. So, yes. okay. So here was the thing. Brandon had this, this unimaginable stories about being, I mean, I mean I've met at some addicts. I've had some friends who've passed, but none of them lived a life <laughs> that was so desperate. Yeah. Um, th you know, his whole, he had a 20 year period of his life that was an unrelenting struggle to stay high. Yeah. And he would do anything. It didn't matter. He would sell his body to a middle-aged man for a $10 pill of dope. Yeah. Um, he would steal from the, the people he loved the most and claim he didn't do it even when he got caught. I know, I know a little something about that. <laughs> yeah. And we all went through yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah. so Brandon... Novak had this idea where Novak would stay productive being sober by making a book. And it was actually April Margera's original idea. She had a dream that he was like walking the yeah. red carpet of some event and, you know, had some hit movie and book. And so Novak and Bam came to me and said, Franz, you were the only one out of all of us who went to college other than Rake, but he's a chemist. Yeah. So, you know, I had taught school. And I was no longer and, around. <laughs> yeah. I had already graduated. Well, you had, you had three Ds and an F. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. This is this started, no, the Dream Seller Project yeah. started in 2005. Yeah. So you were still, it was, it was right around the time when you were saying bye-bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. so um, they came to me and they, they said, look, can you help out? And I said, I said, I'm going to end up writing the whole fucking book. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm not doing this. You took one look at that sentence structure. <laughs> Little did I know, I ended up writing the whole book. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I sat Brandon down. I said, here's the way an outline works. And he had a couple chapters written. You know, they were yeah. short. They needed a lot of work, but there was heart. Yeah, they yeah, were yeah. good. 
Yeah. You know, he had that, that Novak gift of gab. So I said, look, here's the way an outline works. So I sat for a fucking day and a half, and I made this whole fucking outline with him. I'm like, so here's the parts you have to write to make this outline come to life. When yeah. you write on these parts, I will come back, and we'll, we'll work on crafting this together. Okay. So two weeks later, I come back, and I'm like, hey, so how's the writing going, dude? He goes, what writing? I'm like, the book. He goes, oh, yeah, I've been like, doing a lot of writing, dude. Like, he would carry <laughs> blank notebooks around with him, fill up the first page, and say, I'm writing just to get. I mean, at that point, he was doing drugs. Yeah, again like, because I thought you were going to say you came back, there's a needle in his arm. He's just like, yeah, it's there not could've, There could have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, actually, there wasn't at that point. But so I said, where's the outline that I gave you? I told you what to write about. And he yeah. goes, oh, I lost it. I was like, fuck you, dude. Yeah, like, I gave a, a day and a half of my time for you, and I wrote that down, and it's gone. And it's gone from your memory, I'm sure. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. Dude, that just like made so, me think about how difficult it must be to work with an addict. Like, cause it's, cause I, I, you know, I am too, and I'm in the program, and I sponsor people, and I do those things, and, and it can be very frustrating and, and upsetting and things like that as you go through it. But just trying to actually do it like a business matter with it with an addict would gotta be like over the years. He threatened challenge. to sue me. I've yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so so anyway, so I came back in like six weeks, mm -hmm. and he goes here. And he had, I was like, what's all this? He goes, it's writing. I'm like, of what? He goes, that outline. I was like, I thought you lost it. He goes, I found it. <laughs> I was like, you're serious about this? He goes, yeah. So then we started working on it. And so the book became, you know, bestseller. It was, you know, it's on Amazon every year. It goes up to number one again. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is 10 years after. Yeah. And so we did a revised copy. Of, so, oh, so the book comes out. And I, now, at the point when the book came out, he was a hopeless drug addict. He was yeah, yeah. wandering the streets of Baltimore again <coughs> on heroin. And uh, he, I get a call. I was like, why does my book end up with me being a drug addict? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, Brandon, the fact that it's on shelves <laughs> yeah. out in bookstores and you haven't read it yet. I think that that's a good indication of where life, of where, good. well, I don't want people to think that. I'm like, fuck you, man. Yeah. I was like, you listen to me. I remember. I'm not, I don't want yeah. you to be the poster boy of sobriety. You're, uh, we, we're here to tell the truth. I can't in good conscience tell, have the book, and then I was sober, and if I can do it, you can do it too. Yeah, yeah. Ah, and fuck yeah. that. We yeah. need to tell yeah. the truth right. because that's what's going to help people get better. Yeah. And luckily, years, so years later, Last year in 2017, we had the once in an opportunity lifetime to go back and add a new chapter to the end. And so after all those years, Dream Seller finally had a happy ending. And so now I'm currently writing the sequel. I'm almost done. It's called The Streets of Baltimore. And if you thought the stories in Dream Seller were hardcore, <laughs> this makes it seem like a fucking Hansel and Gretel fairy tale, dude. <laughs> like, you Damn. may as well read Snow White if you're going to read Dream yeah. Seller, because the new book, Damn. The Streets of Baltimore, is, oh my God, dude. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's, yeah. it's been That's so much awesome. fun to write. Yes, yeah. I haven't had a paycheck doing it, and I'm completely broke. So make sure you do the go for Write to the Joe Franz fund. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, that's awesome, man. And, and you know, I'm curious to uh, to read it and and to uh, kind of see more of that story unfold. I th I think you know, obviously, both of us being his friend, it's really cool to see it on this side of the equation. I I had told him actually when he was on the podcast at one point, and it and it and it did pain me to. I I was glad to be able to tell it to him now. And him be alive for it but um one time i had you know i moved to california so i was living out there and i was back visiting family and you know this was probably my guess 2012 13 or something like that and uh and i'm like driving into westchester and uh and like i was just making the right on that chestnut street there and i drive past and i see novak it's probably like 11 in the morning looking like the biggest pile of shit, like by himself walking up the street. And, and it was like, he looked like he was either trying to go score drugs or he's coming off or whatever's happening. And I was like, man. And I drove right by, didn't say anything, just kept going. What and, could you say? And I thought, like, and I thought to myself and I threw up a prayer right then. And I was like, yo, I was like, God, like help that dude. And it was so weird to feel like such a stranger from somebody that was like a brother to me. 
and then just to look at them and go, I can't go anywhere near that. And I just have to hope that the universe has something in store. And then you see them now and, and it's like, fuck yeah. Like, but it's crazy because I never would have thought that he would have made it. I mean, for sure, I thought we were going to his funeral. Mm -hmm. You know, and and now he's he's doing so much and helping people and, and all that. And, and it's it's just cool to see life kind of get shot back into him. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what happens when you when you give up the shit and, uh, and it's a hard road. But uh, but but amazing stuff happens when you when you when you get when you straighten up and get sober and, and do the work, because the work is the fucking hard part, you know, and it, it's easy to it's easy to stop shooting dope and it's easy to stop drinking and it's easy to stop doing all that. It's hard to live after that without having that coping mechanism, hmm. you know? And so I think that's really cool to see that he's got that and he's thrown himself in full fledged and, uh, and, and, and just, you know, y your part in that and, in, in kind of, regardless of whether you know it or not, I, I believe that it has affected it so much because just those simple things of you holding on to the truth and, and, and putting the truth in that book mm -hmm. makes someone who does actually maybe want to get better a little bit go, fuck, that is the truth. Okay, I've been able to live this lie. I've been able to manipulate everybody for all these years, but one of my closest friends who's been helping me with this won't allow me to manipulate him. Fuck. You know what I mean? And yeah. that and that I think makes somebody go I re it really gets to the soul of a person. Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. So I don't know. So it's pretty cool and uh and and the graphic novel is is awesome, oh, you know. Thank you, uh, yeah, man. like uh yeah, that, that that's the uh, I think you have a copy of it. Yeah. I always come prepared to promote Look myself. Look at all these souvenirs uh, Mr. Franz brought on. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is our graphic novel. Yeah. So what this is is um, – so we had some stories that were – more or less difficult to tell in a narrative form in a book. Yeah. So I decided to make this Brandon Novak Chronicles, and it cost a, you know cost me a lot of money and time to do. But yeah. it was, it, it's it's an art you know it's 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 my art, and I've always lo loved graphic novels and things. You know, like Peter Bag, Daniel Klaus, Weirdo Magazine, neat stuff. Anything by Fantagraphics, Robert Crumb. Like I was in the movie Crumb. Yeah. You know? like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was like in one of the audience scenes. It's like so <laughs> cool, you know. So yeah. I've always been into this world. So this is kind of like a return to, um, like an '80s, '90s golden age of indie comics style of writing. And so we, we and but my thing was, I was like, how can I weasel CKY into this? Because yeah. it was always a time in my life I wanted to return to. Yeah. You know. So so there's there's a there's a story in it about there's two stories in it about Novak hopelessly wandering the streets of Baltimore. Very dark, right? So yeah. we have this, the same artist did this, Emmanuel Koch. Yeah. He's amazing, but he did five different stories and five unique art styles. Yeah. It's crazy. I know, it's awesome, yeah. So it's you, like, you, 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 you sent me out a copy. Yeah, yeah well, I got I, some more copies yeah, upstairs. Yeah, that's but cool. There's, so um, it, it was so like the the ones where he's in attic on the streets of Baltimore, they're like a deep macabre, black yeah, and white. exactly. And really then there's, there's a story about when, called The Cat Who Loved the Shit in Tony Hawk's Bathtub, yeah. which is when <laughs> Novak went and visited Tony Hawk in the 80s. <laughs> and it's a fucking funny story. Yeah. But the, the key story in this is a, a CKY story. It's, it's the 40-page feature story of the fucking graphic novel. And it was like I got to – I purposefully chose a story that included everyone in a CKY crew. So you got yeah. Phil and Ape. You got, you, you, know, you got Bam. You got you. You got Rake. Um, you got Ryan Dunn, you know, and it's like, and it was so cool to be able to even like bring Dunn back to life for one more story that he was a part. And it's a true yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. It's not bullshit that we made up. It's yeah. fucking true. So it's like, the reader gets to feel like they're there with the CKY crew on an adventure. Like there was never, was that they've never been able to to accompany them on a journey like this, you know. And it's yeah. an addiction story. It's a Novak centered story. Yeah. But to me. Like, I, I don't know if they can really see some of the artwork. I'm just going to hold it up real quick just yeah. in case they, they can. But it's like the artwork, I don't even know if they can fucking see that. But it's just, yeah. It, 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 you guys have a conversation at the end of this, which I believe um, at the end of this one comic that I, I think encapsulates the special relationship we all had. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, um, no, it's awesome. So, yeah, no, that's cool. And so where can they get it? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you can get this on, on uh, Amazon. You can get it on BrandonNovak.com for international shipping. Okay. But the easiest place for anyone to get it is Amazon. And um, the, thank you. Uh, yeah, dude. No, it's but, so cool. But I have, I have yeah. something. I know we're short on time. And I have something very special I want to show you. 
Okay. It's a very, very yeah, special yeah, yeah. thing. It Let's... really is. All right. So, okay, we're making Haggard. And Ryan Dunn has a wardrobe problem, right? So at first we start getting... <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> is there a certain patch over a certain something that... Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we start, well, at first he yeah. started wearing the wrong wardrobe. So Bam would, oh, oh, the Bam wardrobe, would undershoot yeah. everything. Because like, he never had the eye patch either. Right? No, yeah. yeah, yeah. So for, at first it was yeah. his wardrobe. It was yeah. like... We would shoot a scene, and I'd be like, bam, we need a close-up. It's like, we don't need a close-up, I got it. I'm like, we have a two-shot, we need a close-up. No, trust me, we got it. Then he gets into the editing, we need a close-up. I'm like, bam, you son of a bitch. Now I got to go out and fucking film. So yeah. Don would like wear a completely different outfit, and then he would wear, so then the eye patch, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so half the scenes, so it's like, so one-third through the way through the movie, he gets stabbed in the eye with a fork by a girl in a coffee shop, yep. and then for another two-thirds of the movie, he has to wear an eye patch over the one eye. Now, some of the scenes we would film, so Ryan Dunn had, so I was shooting and producing. I was way too fucking busy to deal with wardrobe. Yeah, yeah. Jen Ravel, I believe it was her, at first her job, to, 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 <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to, to remember first, the wardrobe. I love it, and then it had to move on but to the, someone else. Yeah. yeah, well, Bam kept her too busy with arguing all the time, yeah, yeah, so yeah, she couldn't yeah, possibly yeah, yeah, keep yeah. up with it. Well, and the funny thing is, too, just so people that don't make movies know, you shoot movies out of order. Yes. So the scenes are all over the place, and that's why it's like, oh, like you had a patch here, but you didn't there, and you have to have a script supervisor that like takes note of those kind of things. But when you don't have that in an indie film type of way, you you know you you kind of improvise. But yeah, it's not why like why didn't you explain that to Dunn? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like you shoot oh, the whole movie in order, so then you know from now on you wear the eye patch, or from now on you have this outfit on for this whole day. It's, right. like, it's like this scene, then that scene, then right. this scene, then that scene. And, and so, yeah. But everyone had a script, and they had, uh, I gave everyone a, a, a shooting schedule. Yeah. And I was like, M -m -m do all your notes on there. But R Ryan just didn't do what he thought he would remember, and it was his first movie, okay? So, uh, he, you know, we get to pass and all that stuff. But, but he would always wear, so some scenes... He was supposed to wear the fucking eye patch and he didn't. Other scenes, he he fucking wasn't supposed to wear it and he did. And then other scenes, he wearing the wrong eye. <laughs> yeah. So somewhere yeah. in the world, there's a whole other movie where he's not wearing the fucking eye patch. And uh, <laughs> and so Bam fucking now it cost Bam ten thousand dollars and yeah. it cost me two weeks of time. Like Ryan's mad at, at me for being mad at him. He's like, dude, what the fuck? Like you're mad at me? I'm like. I wasted two weeks. Like all you had to do is redo the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Bam wasted ten thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, we're mad. Yeah. <laughs> so we're a little bit frustrated. Yeah, and one yeah. And one time I was talking about it. So he was. So we got in a big fight over this. So yeah. he was behind me in this one room, and it was it wasn't anything I brought up to his face. I didn't bring up to his face. I was talking shit behind his back. Yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah, 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 I totally was. Yeah, but yeah. I was like, I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> yeah. that wasn't true. I yeah, was just yeah, like, yeah. Bam was complaining about the fucking money he lost and yeah. like why we're so behind budget, behind schedule, yeah. and Bam's panicking over money. And I'm like, fucking. And he's talking about Dunn, and I'm like, yeah, dude, if Dunn spent. Fucking one tenth the time remembering his lines <laughs> and remembering what he's supposed to wear. Then he did go into bars bragging that he was in a cool movie. Yeah, he yeah, wouldn't have yeah. to be here. And all of a sudden, you're, what the fuck? You're talking shit. I'm like, I'm not talking shit. That's the truth, motherfucker. I'm talking so the we, truth. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. he was mad for a little while over that. Yeah, and yeah. because when one person's mad at him, Bam gets mad. Then Bam gets mad. He gets everyone else mad at you. Then it's oh, yeah. drama forever. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, what is the uh, so? Sh Bring it up. No, no, no. This is good. So <laughs> okay. there's a story yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. like this. Yeah. I know we're, we're short on time. No, we're this, not. This is worth it. And you just got these 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 people waiting outside. I, but they I don't can care. wait. They Let them wait. wait. They, they, <laughs> we're not short. We got plenty of time. So we made the movie Ming Hags, which is a sequel to Haggard. And yeah. I was the only one sober on that whole movie, right? And I'm not talking shit on Bam, or because this is all things that he talked about. He talked about this in the commentary of the film. So I'm not saying anything. I'm not You're not revealing. talking shit when it's the truth. I think we just went over that. Yeah. Well, he, he talks about <laughs> yeah, it in the commentary. He yeah, had yeah, a severe yeah. cocaine addiction when yeah. we made that movie mm -hmm. and severe alcohol problem. There were scenes yeah. he didn't even remember shooting. Right. And so it was very difficult for me because you know how Bam gets when he gets temperamental and someone else is sober, he gets mad at them. You know, so it was very fucking difficult. <laughs> but what I didn't know is Ryan had a big, was going through a terrible time. So when yeah. we did Jackass 2, right. he was drugged by a horse. And when that happens, so people used to kill each other that way in the old West. Right. So it's like the half the rope was tied to his feet, the other half was tied to the horse. They slapped the horse in the ass, it goes. Yeah. He gets fucking yanked. Ha ha ha. Funny. He had a blood clot right. and almost dislocated his shoulder. 
So now he's on Coumadin, which is a blood thinner, which some people take that, they get amnesia, they get severe depression, some yeah. get suicidal. Well, all those things happen with Ryan. And he went through severe, and so he, s severe depression. He doesn't, he went to a point he didn't, and I didn't know this till later, till after it was over. He didn't think he was funny anymore. He didn't think he was worthy of being in show business. He fucking hated himself. He fucking, like he was severely depressed. He, and, and so at the same time, he's on painkillers for the shoulder. And so he goes to the doctor because he's depressed. Now he's on antidepressants. Those are the magic three, Coumadin, painkillers, and, f and fucking antidepressants. Yeah, adios. So now he's taking more and more of these, and he's in this fucking heart, and he has no one to talk to because the Coumadin's making him fucking think weird thoughts. Yeah. He went into such a dark place. I talked to him a little bit th at that point. Uh, did you? Time. Yeah, because I, had, I was away from the situation, mm -hmm. and I think that he felt safe in that or whatever, you know, or we just – like we just reached out and because I had talked to him about how I didn't want to be around the situation either because it was just too destructive and it was difficult for me and we got to a place where he was like dude you know whatever makes you happy and whatever if he's like if you feel that way because I'm starting to feel that way and this you know and so we went we we went there mm -hmm. on some conversations with that because yeah it was he was in a dark spot as, as a result of that but um because he was really trying to get me to do the second movie with everybody and uh i didn't know that yeah and and like i just didn't want to be a part anymore i needed to like move on with yeah. my life and uh because i was i didn't in know a that healthy place i yeah. didn't know he was trying to get you to make yeah Hags so this. yeah uh well ming Hags, and he was trying to get me to do jackass too and mm. and all like he was just trying to kind of get me back in the mix yeah, and okay. i i um I just, I was in a dark place too, you know? Mm -hmm. So then it, it was kind of like we could commiserate in that, but I think it helped one another, yeah. you know, to some degree. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, but so, yeah. So, so when we were making Ming Hags, I didn't know. Yeah. It's a, luckily before he passed, far before he passed, he cleared himself up. So the story does yeah. have a happy ending yeah, for yeah. Ryan. Yeah. You know, he, but so when we were making Ming Hags, he had this horrible pill problem. And I wasn't aware of it, you know? And so we would be in the middle of a take, not even in between scenes. So there's scenes and there's takes. So yeah. a scene is when you set up all the lights and then the takes is like, all right, take one, take two. Yeah. So we're, we would film a scene and it'd be like, okay, uh, that was great. Okay, but you stand a little bit closer. You act a little bit more mad. People in the crowd come up a little bit. All right, good. We're ready yeah. to go and ready for action. Where's done? <laughs> done. Yeah. Where's Ryan? Someone would be like, he took off. I'm like, what? Where did he go? So the, you're texting him, you're calling him, he doesn't get back. Then he's fucking back in like 20 minutes. It's like, where were you? And it was always an excuse. Oh, you know, my um, my my, uh, my mom needed help with something. My uh, you know, my yeah. um, there was a uh, the alarm went off in my shop. The cops were there. I had to fill out all these reports. The third time today. <laughs> but I didn't know yeah. any of this. Did he, right. when you're, He's covering when you need stuff, yeah. pills yeah. and you're in that bad way, you ration them. You're like, I'm only going to take three pills. Then yeah. you get there and all three are gone. You need more. It's just right. the way it is, you know? And then you're, yeah. Cause, cause you do that to yourself. And I did that with drugs too, is mm -hmm. you try to tell yourself, oh, I'm going to do this. And then as soon as that's gone, you have this insane, like panic feeling of like, I need to go get it. I need, I need it. I can't, you can't do anything until you get it. Just yeah. two more pills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll be fine. And then he would go and then we'd come back to the more and then he would have to leave again. Yeah. And so finally I took him and I didn't want to repeat of the Haggard fight that I had with him. So I was like, listen, please. I don't yeah. know why you're leaving all the time. I don't know what's going on, but when you leave, please, you got to tell me so I can shoot something else in the meantime. Right. I was like, we're, we're, we, we got extras. We got all this shit to worry about, dude, please. You like, were uh, trying to hold together something that was breaking apart. <laughs> it was Because at that time I was already out of the mix. You were so lucky you didn't and, work on that fucking film. Ryan had uh. always had those feelings of wanting to bail. And then Brandon sort of did right after that. And it was, yeah, it was definitely the, uh, the band was breaking up. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was, yeah. The band was, the, at that point, the band had been breaking up for years. Yeah. Which is, we didn't know it yet when we were still playing covers yeah 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 <laughs> so uh yeah yeah so dunn says to me he says i uh, so at the end of the night he came to me and he said i got your present and i was like what and i'm in the middle of eight million things i'm like wrapping up they're gonna pack any equipment signing yeah, paychecks yeah, 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 giving yeah. people scripts and i'm like what do you mean you got me a present he goes 
He goes, I got you a present. When you get a moment, it's over there on your notebooks and your script. And I'm like, why'd you get me a present? He goes, I want you to know, you and me, we might get into some arguments. We've got many arguments over the years. Everyone does. He yeah. said, you and me are always going to be friends. We're going to get, we're, we'll always be cool. We'll always be yeah. friends, man. And I was like, okay. And he gives me a hug. And I was like, where did this come from? Yeah. And I go to my fucking notebooks. Yeah, look at that. What is it? What's there? Open it. See what he gave me. <laughs> the eye patch. Uh, <laughs> put it, should I put it on? <laughs> Dude, that's that's amazing. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like he. So I asked him about it later, and he said when we made. Yeah. God, it's almost scary to open this for me. It's like. Uh, yeah. And so when he was so, when we made haggard he always kept this in his glove compartment and when we yeah. were done he always fucking returned it like at first he bought a million of them and they yeah. were all over his car and, and fucking and then he had one he would always keep it was his go-to and when he moved into his new car you know how you just grab all your shit and put it in there yeah so it had always been in there and he saw it when he was rooting around in there and he wanted me to have it just so i remembered the the argument and the and just that we would always be cool and just the fact that he wanted me to have it and yeah. it was like I want to make, like, I have it, like, I have envisioned, like, I haven't gotten around to make it, but I want to have, like, a little fucking shrine of, like, a him, a picture of him in my house. Yeah. You know, with this, it's like. And, I mean, I, I kind of love that it's in this, you know? Like, I, I kind of love that it's, that it is the way it is, but, I mean, but, a, you know. A, well, that's just how o, I keep it. He didn't, the patch was him. just in with my shit. I put it in that yeah, special Yeah, but mark. I like it. But, yeah, but I like it. It's cool, man. And, that, and that's an, an awesome thing to have, an awesome memory to have yeah. with him. It's just. Yeah. It's just so weird because, like, there's so many memories from that fucking eye patch. And it's like when I open it up, it's like <laughs> it takes me back to that time. Yeah. to like, mm, man. man. Yeah. No, that's and the, yeah, that's cool. No, it is. It is fun to go back down that, that memory lane because it's uh, it's even it's just been fun sitting there chatting with you and kind of re reliving that. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool stuff, man. Well, I guess so, that's about all the time we have. We got because we got <laughs> halfway through. I don't know if you noticed. I got a phone call. Yeah, those were the producers. That's CJ and Taylor who do yeah. my the Novak and Franz show. So they've been sitting out there for uh, you know all this time yeah. in their car, and it snowed last <laughs> night, and they're fucking freezing cold. <laughs> let, them, let them freeze. We got the bathroom break podcast to do here. Well, dude, it's been awesome sitting with you, and I'll have to have you on, uh, you know, again because there there are more stories. I got, oh, and, I got. I guess so. We didn't even cover any of this. I mean, shit, yeah, there's tons of stuff, but it but it's been awesome to sit down and chat you, yeah. and, uh, and and dude, uh, let's uh, let's go do your podcast now. Yeah. So listen to us on the the uh, Novak and Franz, or is it Franz and Novak? <laughs> it's Novak and Franz. The Novak hey, and Franz seriously, uh, podcast. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah. Uh, I love what you're doing. I think this is such a cool grassroots thing, you know, like, and the people you reach out to, like, from comedians to people in bands and just, like, people you know and, and from your community. It, it's like, it, it's it's a special thing, and I thank you, and I love you, Rab. And, yeah, I love and you, dude. I just, <laughs> hell yeah. Just seeing dude, you, yeah. it's like a whole nother. <laughs> era of my life opens up whenever i see you yeah you know now i'm the same way um, it's awesome yes yeah. yeah. so, well thanks for doing it thanks for being a part and it's, right, like i said just uh, thanks for helping us create some some awesome memories all together thank you because that shit that I, I remember that part of my life is, is is you know some of the best times of my life mm -hmm. so uh very cool well let's go uh french kiss each other <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks all right. bye everybody <laughs> thank you I, I have a lot that I wanted to kind of know about you, um, you know, like your sexual preferences, how many thumbs you put in your Yay. ass when. Three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>